Coming up on DTNS, food delivery not doing so well as you might have thought it would. Autonomous cars have challenges without real people to drive past and why an AI can't get a patent. This is the Daily Tech News for, I'm going to call it Wednesday, April 29th, 2020. It's my sister's birthday. Happy birthday, Meg. I'm in Los Angeles, and I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm at Studio Redwood, and I'm Sarah Lane. I'm in Salt Lake City, and I'm Scott Johnson. And on this Wednesday, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, we were just having a uh, spirited debate about whether there is such a thing as savory cake. Uh, we also quoted a lot of Whitney Houston. That's on Good Day Internet. Get the expanded show. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Apple and Google are delivering the first version of their Exposure Notification API to selected developers working on apps for public health organizations. After this test round, the API is expected to be released broadly in mid-May. The updates come in the beta of Apple's Xcode 11.5 and iOS 13.5 and Google's Play services in Android Developer Studio. Apple and Google will release a sample code on Friday. Working together. Google made its enterprise video conferencing service, Google Meet, available for free to anyone with a Google account. Meetings ha can have up to 100 participants. After September 30th, Google may limit free meetings to 60 minutes. The free version does not offer phone-in options. Google Meet will also be integrated into Gmail. Apple added COVID-19 test sites to its Apple Maps in the United States. Make it easier for you to find them if you use Apple Maps. Also updated its Mobility Trends site, which offers data on how people are moving around in order to assist local governments with lockdown policy. The update includes improved regionalization, like state and province-level search, and more cities available to review. Google launched Shoelace back in 2019 as a way for people to find group activities with other people in the area who shared interests. If you're like, I've never even heard of it, well, it was only available on iOS in New York City. But Google has decided to shut down Shoelace instead of expanding it as of May 12th. Samsung declined to give an annual forecast due to its uncertainty over the economic climate. It believes its memory chip sales will be strong due to PC and server sales, but smartphones and TVs may not sell as well. Uh, due to a possible dip in consumer spending right now, Samsung's operating profit rose 3% in quarter one on strong chip sales. And that's keeping the roundup of earnings going. Spotify reported positive net income of a million dollars, a rise of 31% for paid users, 32% for ad-supported free users. Listening patterns have also changed. Spotify says every day now looks like the weekend. We call that Blur's Day, Spotify. <laughs> uh, more earnings. LG reported a 21.1% operating profit increase over last year and its highest Q1 profit margins ever at 7.4%. LG saw strong sales of home appliances and TVs. Smartphone sales, though, fell 34%. LG plans to control production and marketing costs to guard against decreased demand for the rest of the year. All right. We quickly mentioned the Alphabet earnings yesterday, but we got more details now. Tell us about it, Scott. All right. Alphabet reported quarter one revenue up 13 percent and net income up 1.5 percent. Those are good numbers. Profit was affected by a slowdown in ad revenue in March. YouTube rose 33 percent to four billion and cloud revenue rose 55 percent to 2.8 billion. Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai said video conferencing service Google Meet has been growing at, at three million new users per day. That's up from $2 million last month. Alphabet's other bets, uh, all in its non-Google companies, lost $1.1 billion. Alphabet uh, expects quarter two to be difficult for uh, due to its advertising business. Yeah, the advertising uh, outlook for, for Google is not great. Uh, but this indicates, you know, it's only one March, uh, one, one, one month of the quarter with the lockdown effect. It indicates that the effect might not be as bad as people thought, at least in March. Uh, but everybody, every earnings report is saying, but just don't get too excited. We really don't know why, how Q2 is going to shape up. Uh, and it sounds like like Google is no exception to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, was, it was Netflix recently saying things are going to look bad. Don't say we didn't warn you. And I think especially a company the size of Alphabet uh, with so many offshoots, it's interesting. Something like Meet. It's like, all right, let's let's bake this into something that's a way more uh, easy for users to to find and use because they are using it already. Let's make mm -hmm. it a free product uh, like lots of other Google products that just become daily parts of people's lives. All smart stuff. But, yeah, the advertising revenue is 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 the big question mark. 
all this stuff about Google Meet and them letting everybody with a Google account use it and all of that got me to wondering, has have any of us used it yet or tried it or messed with it? I have, uh, yeah. but I was using it, uh, I think, you know, I don't know if I, here's the problem. I was using it and it said meet, dot, meet in the URL, but I might've been using Hangouts. Oh. <laughs> Uh, okay. because Google has, has made such a hash of everything because Google meet is different from hangouts video. Anyway, it didn't work very well for me when I used it, but, uh, I think it's smart to make meet free for everybody. If let's assume the enterprise version of meet is better than hangouts. Uh, and, and if you can get people to be using it for free, they're more likely to suggest it for their workplace and then yeah. the workplace will pay for it. Mm. Yeah. It's also good for them to, I don't know. I mean, all this talk about people in Zoom and Zoom kind of getting the branding that it never had before and then suddenly has. These other companies are probably anxious to to get their products in front it's, of people. And it Google's kind of different. drives me crazy in a way. And I know it's, you know, we follow the stuff more than the average person. But when someone uses Zoom the way that they use Kleenex, right, where it's like it's a brand name for a term of a platform kind of thing. I'm like, guys, you know, you have like. 10 other comparable options to Zoom, right? Not saying yeah. you shouldn't use it, but it's not your only choice here. And it must really bum like Microsoft out that people aren't using Skype like the Kleenex term anymore, or at least right. they're not as much yeah, as they were. Yeah, that's a good point. They're good starting point. to use Zoom that way. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, and, and the bright spot here for Alphabet is cloud revenue rising 55% at a time when they need to have momentum because more people are using the cloud for all kinds of things. Meet is a great way to market that, to get people into G Suite, which is their cloud service. Uh, two more earnings reports, and then we're done. Microsoft reported revenue right before the show, up 15% year over year, $1.40 earnings per share, beating analyst expectations. Azure, Microsoft's cloud service, grew 59% year over year. Office 365 commercial income grew 25%. LinkedIn grew 21%. Xbox Surface and Search were all flat, and Microsoft noted that there is minimal COVID-19 impact on its Q1 results. So it expects if there is going to be an impact, that will happen in Q2. And we may hear on their earnings call what that impact would be. Facebook also announced that in Q1, it brought in $17.74 billion, up almost 18% from the same quarter in 2019. Facebook now says it has 2.99 billion monthly users across its family of apps, uh, up from 2.89 billion last quarter. The company claims it's stabilizing after seeing an initial steep de decrease in advertising revenue in March due to COVID-19. So they're the first one to say, like, we think we might have reached bottom. They're not saying what that bottom is yet, though. Well, in other Facebook news, Facebook has open sourced a chatbot called Blender that it claims can talk about pretty much anything. Blender was trained on 1.5 billion publicly available Reddit conversations. <laughs> Just laugh at that. It was then refined with additional data sets for conversations that contain emotion, information dense conversations like the one you'd have with an expert, and conversations between people who have distinct personas for their personality. So, it, you know, two people who might have different opinions or different ways of speaking. The model is so big, it needs two chips to run. Facebook claims that Blender is more engaging and more human than Google's MenaBot, which was launched in January. And Blender fooled human evaluators 49% of the time, so almost half the time, into thinking its conversations were human, were, were happening in a human-like way, especially if the conversations were kept short. Sometimes there are giveaways when it goes on and on. For example, Blender also occasionally makes up facts since it uses correlations rather than a knowledge base. So it might tell you something that just isn't true because it's kind of heard it from other people. Yeah, so I mean, this is a big achievement because you can train a good chatbot to have conversational skills for a very specific purpose, right? And you see that in business a lot. Like as soon as you stray outside of its specific purpose, it's like, I don't know what to say to you. Uh, voice assistants are trying to be more general, but they're just not very good at it. You still have to know how to say the thing you want it to do. So this is a promising advance to be saying, we have a general purpose conversational chatbot uh, that could understand you. I'm, 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 I wanna read from, uh, from the, you tell me which is the human and which is the AI. Uh, just a couple things. Hi, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Do you have a favorite food? Mine's lobster. Doing well. My favorite food is cake. I just bought one because I got promoted at work. Congratulations on the promotion. What kind of work do you do? I work in software. Thanks so much. I just want to make my parents proud. I'm an engineer. Hmm. I mean, it's that could be human. Which one's human and which one's the bot? There was one human and one bot in that. I think um, the one that that 
liked lobster was the bot. Scott? I'm going to agree with her. I think it's the lobster. That one. is the giveaway, right? It's like yeah. bringing up lobster it was, just was a like, little weird. Yeah. But also, I just want to make my parents proud was a little weird, but that was the human. So. Hmm. <laughs> it's interesting. Some humans really do want to do that. But is yeah. it, this is the big, the big ultimate thing we keep wanting, though. We want to have natural conversations. I was watching something, Westworld or something the other day, and in movies anymore, when somebody's talking to their home system that's doing all the stuff for them, turning off lights and doing other things, their conversations are always kind of hushed and garbled and they're kind of like, uh, please turn that off. And then the TV turns off. The thing it intuitively knows, you can kind of mumble it. You don't have to say it clearly. We're not there yet, but I can't wait for that. I want them to hear me and I want to talk back to my devices in a way that is no different than people. And I can say it slowly or quietly or as I turn and the, and the Doppler effect of my voice going that direction doesn't confuse it. That that is the ultimate goal. This feels like a step in that direction. Well, and just especially since there's so much um, like telemedicine, for example, I, I keep trying to get an optometry appointment with Kaiser and it's just like not happening. It's not essential as far as Kaiser is concerned. They have bigger fish to fry. Totally get that. But if something like this were to get me pretty close to a certain point where I could get some answers, mm -hmm. this is a great thing. Because it, it, I could kind of explain like a human the way I would talk to a doctor, and you don't necessarily have to have somebody sitting by a phone somewhere to you know ingest my information and try to try to get me to the appropriate place. Okay, one more test. I can't resist. All right. Number one, what are some of your favorite bands? Number two, I like Modest Mouse and the Smashing Pumpkins. Number one, I love the Smashing Pumpkins. I saw them in concert a few years ago. Number two, what's your favorite Smashing Pumpkins song? Mine is today. Number one, today is a great song. My favorite song of theirs is Geek USA. Number two, that's an amazing track, too. You have great taste. Number one, thank you. Number two is the bot. Yeah, two. How did you know? I don't. I just feel it. I have just a feeling, too. That. that was pretty I closer. That was a much, much closer, though. Yeah, number two, number there was, was something about. about you have great taste where I'm like, that just is like a throwaway thing that sounded like a robot. Oh, no, yeah. you have great taste was the human. Oh, well, okay, oh, I got it wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got that wrong too. I was like, the robot was buttering us up. So obvious. No, yeah. it was a person, nope, just a really polite person. Uh, the bot liked Geek USA, the human liked today. All right. U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has rejected two patents where the AI system Dabus, D A B U S, was listed as the inventor. Dabus's creator, Stephen Thale, said that the system came up with a design for interlocking food containers and a rhythm for a hard to ignore warning light on its own. And so he felt it would be inaccurate to list himself as the inventor. And US patent law says an inventor has to be an individual, not a corporation, and an AI is not either one. So in this ruling, the USPTO said the inventor had to be a natural person. Now this ruling may be appealed, but I get what Stephen Thale's saying, he's like, I'm not, I, I didn't create this. The AI created it. It is a novel, otherwise it would be patentable. It's a patentable idea, but the idea came out of the AI, but I also get what the patent office is saying, which is like, yeah, but the AI isn't self-aware. It can't imagine things yeah. and it can't therefore own a patent. It can't defend a patent. I it mean, if, Steve, no if, if Stephen uh, Thale was like, but like I didn't make it smart to the point where it made me these tools that worked for me then yeah then you get into these complicated all right so who who gets credit you know it's like at the end of a, like a popular movie it's like well Stephen Thale gets credit for something you know but because at least he leveraged the capability that was there but mm. yeah who gets credit for making AI that ended up making something that was patentable it's so yeah know. what happens when I take Stephen Thale's AI and I press go and it makes a new thing and I patent it. Do I get credit for that? Because I yeah, press well, go or does Stephen Thale point. get it because he d d he made the AI? Well, see, now this this made me think of a new argument before the show because I've all, all morning since I talked to Tom on TMS about this issue, it's been driving me crazy, the kind of example I want to use. And I think I may have finally found it. All right. I'm thinking of original art here. So if he created the AI, wrote the, you know, wrote the learning algorithm that then became this AI, then... He's got that piece in it. But then the AI does something, and that's cool. And maybe something the AI comes up with has its own subset of creative consciousness, if you want to call it that, for lack of a better term. And so it's sort of responsible for that. 
but it's just iteration. It's like anything else. Like, who do we give original credit for for the first working mouse on a computer? Well, we can give it to so and so on who's and such, but we can also say the best mouse was made by Logitech or the best bowler ball version was made by Microsoft or, you know what I mean? Like, we're kind of yeah. iterating down. The question is who gets credit for it? And that's still the question. But that's how it feels to me. It's an original art thing. This guy does deserve ultimate credit because he made the AI. But then so what then the AI if, does without him is I up to buy the AI. His, if I buy his AI and it creates a design for me and I patent that, does he hold the patent on it? See, I don't see that. Oh. Yeah, because it's like a person can hold multiple patents. Sure. Can an AI own the patents that it created even though it was created by a single person? And maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe, maybe it, it was created by 10 people and like five of them worked way harder on it than the other five. And you could, you could, you could <laughs> theoretically divide up the patent among multiple inventors and say, totally. oh, these are the people who invented it. Sure. But sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, the, the World Intellectual Property Organization is, is working on this exact issue because once AI is self-aware, this will get easier because then we can just give AI rights, I suppose. But until then, uh, it, you, you need a new category. For, for AI created designs. Let's talk about Uber. Their longest serving executive CTO, Thuan Pam, is leaving the company, according to an SEC filing. The information source says Uber is considering layoffs that could affect up to 20% of its 27,000 employees. That is a lot. Uber has said its ride hailing business has fallen by 70%, and the information uh, reports food delivery has not made up the difference. Uber rival Lyft said in an SEC filing that uh, they will end up laying off 982 employees, about 17% of its workforce. Lyft will also furlough 288 employees and reduce salaries by 10% for other employees for a 12-week period. Executives at List, Lyft will take a 20 to 30% pay cut. UK food delivery service Deliveroo says it will cut more than 350 of its staff, around 15%. Uh, that's of its global workforce in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia. Deliveroo blames the impact of the virus, which has caused many restaurants to close down altogether and customers to cook rather than order delivery. Yeah, I don't think any of us are surprised that ride hailing uh, is, is, down. is down, right? right. Uh, yeah. Where you but go? I think a, a lot of folks thought that restaurant delivery would would be the the saving grace or at least help make it up. Uh, and it's not. I mean, look at Deliveroo. They, they, that is their business. They don't have another business, and and they're having to lay off people because, it turns out, you know, people are buying groceries, and grocery delivery is doing okay. Mm -hmm. But folks, for whatever reason, just you know, don't want to get something that's made by somebody else right now. I think there's a little feeling of control over making it yourself. There's a whole psychology. Uh, consideration here. And I, I don't really have the answer, but I am definitely, I mean, I am a food delivery aficionado. <laughs> if there is such a thing. I mean, I love food delivery. It's like, I want this thing. I can get it. You pay a premium. If you're okay with that, then you've got your ramen in 30 to 45 minutes. But ever since we've been in shelter in place and in some cases quarantine mode, I have been like baking up a storm and making complicated recipes. Do I have to do that? No, but I am because somehow, you know, I've decided that I don't want to be sitting around and I need to stay busy. And so I need to do more busy work. So it means grocery delivery is still really important to me. I either have to go put a mask on or I get it delivered to me. So the ingredient part of it, I can see being on the rise for all these people who all of a sudden decided to get creative in the kitchen, but it's not necessary in most cases. It just kind of became this trend. Yeah, uh, it's weird. And we were talk, uh, talking in pre-show about the pivot that Uber and Lyft can't really make, uh, branding-wise or otherwise. I mean, there is Uber Eats, and so that's a thing that existed and had some mind share. But um, I don't think of either of them when I think, oh, I, I, I sure hope Lyft and Uber figure out a way to to, to bring me my food or to do other, you know, other services that they, we could benefit from and that they could then therefore keep their businesses alive with. I just don't think of it. Like, yeah. that's not what I think of them as. I think of them as a ride hailing service and there's no way people are going to be sitting around in each other's cars during a time like this. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the answer for them is. I mean, obviously they're all having to scale back. We're reporting those numbers now, but, um, uh, there's, there's real concern for this and every other corner of the gig economy right now. Yeah, uh, that's it's and and people save money when they buy their own groceries and cook themselves, which is also a huge consideration when there are so many totally. people out of work. 
Uh, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Ford today announced it's delaying its plans to launch an autonomous vehicle service to 2022. And they're not the first autonomous company uh, to delay things or take uh, cars off the road. VentureBeat's Kyle Wiggins has an article talking about the challenges faced by autonomous car makers due to shelter in place orders. Back in March, Uber, Cruise, Aurora, Argo AI, and Lyft all suspended real world testing. Waymo not only suspended real world testing, but paused a commercial service it had going on in Arizona, including driverless cars that didn't have humans in them. That means autonomous cars aren't getting real world experience. So the companies are doing a lot of simulations to try to make up for that. The data collected while driving around on real roads with real other drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists is usually how you train and improve the algorithms because you're collecting all that data from LIDAR sensors, cameras, radar, inertial measurement units, odometry, etc. So there are some very interesting ways to try to improve driverless cars while using the real world data they have without adding to it. Uh, real world driving exposes cars to things like dirty stop signs, strange audio, visual data. So they've been simulating that. Uh, it also includes creating centimeter level maps of roads, building vegetation and other static objects. So a lot of these companies are using images of roadways to improve the maps in the simulations. There are the, a lot of challenges here. There's a reality gap. Every model is not inaccurate, is not accurate. Uh, so, so you can accurately simulate the road and, uh, rain and, and all kinds of things, but did you simulate how a tire behaves at high speeds that might be missing? Uh, there are so many things to simulate. You just can't get every single one of them. So the edge cases are what's going to suffer, uh, resources cost more. If you're trying to simulate as many things as possible, that means extra compute time. If you're not able to get that real world data and use that to fall back on, you have to run in the cloud more often and that costs money. Uh, reproducibility, even the best simulators can contain non-deterministic elements and lack of new data. If you can't drive, you have to work with what you have. You also don't have the testing of sensor failure. Uh, you don't know how, how good LiDAR sensors last or when they fail or what conditions cause them to fail if you don't have real-world testing. And then there's the human element. We talked the other day about an AI that worked great in the lab but didn't get implemented well because lighting conditions and 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 human uh, human behavior uh, got in the way. That happens here. You, don't, you can't train your fleet operators in how people are going to behave with autonomous cars if they're not out there with humans monitoring them and riding in them. So... Uh, the VentureBeat article does a great job of breaking down the hundreds of thousands of hours of simulation being done by Aurora and Cruise and Waymo. Hat tip to Lyft, where a senior computer engineer mounted one of their simulation servers with eight graphics card in her bedroom with four desk fans keeping it cool. That way they could keep it running during the lockdown. Uh, another Lyft engineer built an electrolytic corrosion setup in their garage with a Raspberry wow. Pi and circuit boards they got on eBay. And another Lyft uh, engineer converted a backyard cricket pitch into a LIDAR sensor rage with full-size street signs to help calibrate new sensors so they can get a little bit of real-world data uh, into these simulations. But yeah, if you don't have real people to go out and drive around, and if you're not around, allowed to take your cars out on the test track anyway, uh, because people aren't allowed to work in those situations right now, you've got simulations. So the question is, are the benefits of being able to run simulations more often, because that's all they can do, they can devote more time to it and all their engineers to make the simulations as good as possible, going to be enough to let them make progress until the point when they can get back on the road? Well, to me, it feels like a genuine delay. Like, this is really going to push things. Um, because as try as they might and be as ingenuity-minded as they are being over at Lyft and other places to try to fill up the gap, it's just, I feel like it's just too big of a gap. They need real-world testing again. And I, I can't help but think of previous conversations, Tom, that you and I in particular have had, both here and on Current Geek and other places, about how 2020 was the year. Do you remember all that talk? Like, this was the year. And Turns we always out it was the year, but not for what we thought it was going to be the no, year No, it's not. Yeah. And, and it was always the year for these things. It was yeah, like, yeah. we're going to finally see autonomous cars being driven here and here and here, and we're going to see these things come through because the companies were saying that and the, and, the, and the engineers and scientists behind it all were saying that. 
nobody foresaw this other thing, but it just feels like everything's going to have to get shoved. And so maybe 2021 is the new year, or maybe 2022 is more likely the realistic year. But I can't help but think of that in the midst of all this, because these were the things that were coming to fruition, and now they're all stalled out. Well, and, you know, the autonomous car conversation is already complicated. You know, autonomous car gets into an accident. And it's like, well, the person that was the safety driver was looking at their phone or, the, you know, the robots aren't ready yet. This is mayhem. You know, when all of this stuff is we're in that kind of bridge period where it's like, well, it will get worked out for the most part, but we're not there yet. So we're in, you know, this whole testing stage. You take humans out of it and everyone goes like, but isn't the whole point autonomous cars so that the humans don't have to be involved? We're all going to be safer. Yeah, we weren't ready yet, though. We were right. we were getting there and now we've stalled. So well, I don't think we've stalled as much as 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 you might fear because simulations are, are very important. Uber is a great point. You bring up the the death that was related to an Uber uh, autonomous car and how Uber shut down its actual real world driving. And because of that, it's been upping its simulation tools for two years to the point that the company is now using over 2 million miles of sensor logs augmented with simulations to accomplish the vast majority of its training and validation anyway. Uh, and claims that the test track was just being used to validate our models. So validation will have to wait a few months, but Uber doesn't feel like it's that far behind. I don't know. Uh, you can join our Discord. I was trying to think of something witty, but it just it's just sort of, <laughs> I don't know, frustrating more than anything. Uh, you could join our Discord. You got an Uber story, autonomous car story, maybe something about uh, Waymo, maybe something about food delivery. Anything you'd like to chat about, you can chat with your peers, DTNS peers, by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. We got some good news, actually, from yeah. Amos, who says, I am ecstatic to announce that the GDI folding team has cracked into the top one percent of teams worldwide. We're now more than 80 volunteers strong and have run nearly 4,000 simulations, placing us just outside the top 2,000 out of a quarter million teams. Uh, it seems like every day I get somebody emailing me asking me for the number for the Good Day Internet uh, Folding at Home team, trying to turn to crack some information about COVID-19. Uh, so I created a redirect, dailytechnewsshow.com slash folding uh, is where you will go to find the information if you would like to join the Good Day Internet Folding team. Thank you, Amos, for setting that up. Excellent. And shout out to patrons at our master and our grandmaster levels, including Steve Iadarola, Michael Akins, and Chris Allen. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott, you're a busy man. Tell us everything. Well, uh, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, everything would take too long. But uh, the one thing I'm going to tell you about is uh, myself and my daughter, who is also in college right now for an art degree, have decided to do, uh, for the entire month of May, we're going to do free art classes for kids. So if you come to my stream, or to, uh, come to my, our stream page, rather, over on Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash frogpants, uh, or more importantly, go to frogpants.com slash art classes, and you'll learn all about it, art class rather. You'll learn all about what we're going to do. And it's easy to find out what you need to bring, uh, how long we're going to do it. We're going to put it all up on YouTube when we're done. Great activities sort of described. You don't need much, really just crayons and paper, pens and paper, pencils, that sort of stuff. And uh, we're going to teach some basics, some core concepts in uh, some drawing stuff, some cartoon stuff going to have a way for you as parents to give your kids something cool and constructive to do for the next five weeks on a Saturday. If that helps, great. And also there's no limit. If you're 80 and you want to be there and learn how to draw some of this stuff, you're welcome to be there. So anyway, the details are over at frogpants.com slash art class. And uh, it starts this Saturday at 1 p.m. Mountain. So we look forward to seeing a bunch of you there. Yeah. You could learn to draw like Carter Johnson. Yeah, she's very good. Hey, uh, folks, so we like to share the love because the idea here is like if you've got a little money and you spend it on somebody who needs something because they're out of work uh, that helps you, then that helps them. And then they can spend that money on somebody else. And that keeps the economy going. And Frost wanted you to know about a thing she's doing to help knitters. If you like knitting, and I know, I know a bunch of you do. Uh, yarn and fiber festivals have, of course, been canceled. And they're a major source of income for many makers and a source of learning and socializing for knitters, crocheters, spinners, and weavers. The online international Fiber Festival will run from May 1st to the 8th. Each day, participants can visit a different country known for their wool production or knitting traditions, all from the comfort of your own Wi-Fi. There will be fiber craft classes in the morning, 
fact, history, and culture experience in the afternoon, a menu for a regional dinner that you can make from ingredients from your local grocery store, and a one to two hour evening event as well. So just like a real conference. Uh, this has all been organized from what is available online. You do need a membership to myblueprint.com to attend, uh, but they do offer free trials if you just want to try it out. For more information, go to oiff.familypodcasts.com. And of course, you can support us at any level, at any time, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. And if you'd like to join us live, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>